Okay, um, well, at least it works now. So what I was talking about, um, just to briefly recap, so the four sections that I'm going to cover today, the biometric face recognition, extracting soft biometric attributes from face images, then hiding this um, soft biometric information, and then our method for the multi-attribute face privacy. So I uh, briefly went over this problem of face identification and verification. So on the left-hand side, this was the one n matching problem I described where you match the face of a person to um, faces in a database. And on the right hand side, this would be um, the case of face verification where you check whether a person in a photo is indeed the person, let's say, in front of the camera. Um, yeah, and then applications of this, for instance, um, like I mentioned, the security cameras or at an airport where you have these passport scanners, whether um, yeah, you are, it's checking whether you're the same person as on the passport and also for um, missing child identification. Then I briefly talked about these uh, soft biometric attributes that uh, one can yeah, extract from face images. Some uh, face recognition systems um, use also this um, soft biometric information explicitly. So for instance, you can um, have a gender classifier, extract the gender and then attach it together with the face image for a classifier to match both, um, let's say, the face in the picture and the face uh, of a person in front of the camera and also check whether the gender is the same as an additional way of verifying people. Um, so this was just like a brief outline of biometric face recognition. And in this section, I want to um, briefly talk about how easy it is actually to extract such um, soft biometric information from face images. And then we will talk about hiding this uh, information. So it may not look like um, an easy problem, but extracting, for example, the gender of a person is actually pretty simple with nowadays um, deep learning technologies. And this is something everyone could do. I mean, this is not really um, requiring a lot of expertise. So here, what I did uh, as an example, I used an off-the-shelf um, deep learning architecture, uh, residual net 15. You can also use smaller networks. Um, but yeah, I just use it uh, as it is. You can find it in many, on many websites and repositories. It's an off-the-shelf uh, deep learning convolutional network architecture with these um, so-called skip connections. And it's also an old architecture from 2016. So it's not really state of the art. But when I was training this on a data set called uh, Celeb A, which has, I think, around 100 or 150,000 images from Google search of celebrities, I was able to um, achieve 97% um, test accuracy, which is really good, I think, just given that I didn't really tune anything, I just applied this network. So if you really wanted to, I'm sure you could probably get 99% um, accuracy on, on certain data sets if you really uh, employ state-of-the-art architectures and tune it a little bit. So um, yeah, this is just to, to show you that it's really easy if someone wanted to, to extract this type of soft biometric information from face images. Um, then, for instance, uh, regarding the age, another example. This sounds like um, a more challenging problem because, yeah, we humans, I would say it's kind of challenging to tell how old a person really is just by looking at the person. So personally, I am uh, i don't want to guess someone's age, but if I had to, I would probably be off by, let's say, at least 10 years or something like that. So I think it's, it's also a very um, challenging problem for humans, but for also deep learning systems, it's also something that can relatively easily be solved. So to show you another example, so um, this would be, by the way, an example of ordinal regression. Or we can consider this an ordinal regression problem rather than classification. So um, if we approach this as an ordinal regression problem, um, here's just like an overview of what I mean by ordinal regression. So there's the problem of ranking where we have just we are sorting things in a certain order. For example, here my <laughs> favorite movies from least favorite to most favorite. Um, well, let's say the age where we have this information about the label, but it's not really um, independent. So, I mean, there's an order in these labels. They are not um, categories that are not related to each other. So you can have an order. You could technically use a classifier for that, or you can use a metric regression um, model for that. But ideally, I think an ordinal regression problem is uh, well suited for the task because if you consider a person, let's say the, the difference between a person who is 10 years old and 12 years old, it's a two year difference. I think this difference is probably larger 
than the two years of a person in the age range between 80 and 82. Whereas for younger people, it's more like the shape of the head that changes because people are still growing. And for older people, it's maybe more the texture of the skin. It's a more subtle feature. It's a different feature, essentially. So in that way, I think like uh, approaching this as an ordinal regression rather than a metric regression problem might make sense. So we um, kind of, yeah, we, we developed methods for ordinal regression where we applied this to age classification. And just to give you an example, we applied this also yeah, to age data sets where we had, a, for example, one data set with 50,000 or 55,000 face images in the age range between 16 and 70 years and another data set with uh, 165,000 face images in the range between 15 and 40. And this here on the right is a little bit more challenging, this data set, because um, it has been collected from a social media website. So there was another paper that uh, should have probably added the citation there um, that collected this data set and um, they basically crawled a social media website. And on social media, of course, you know, you can upload um, your face images or your portrait photo, however you want in which pose. So the poses are not consistent. Not everyone is looking st straight into the camera. Whereas in the left-hand side, um, I think all pictures were taken with the same camera and in good lighting conditions. So this is a little bit of an easier problem. Um, nonetheless, um, so the main point is here, I just wanted to show you how um, easy it is for deep learning systems to extract age information. So when I applied some of the methods we worked on um, for this MOV2 data set here, we are able to get a prediction accuracy or it's a mean absolute error of 2.6. So this means on average, we are only off by 2.5 or 2.6 years. So the MAE is here the difference, the absolute difference between the actual age, um, YI, is, it's the actual age of a person. And here, this is the predicted age. So um, the absolute value of that, and then averaging over the whole test set. And yeah, you can see two and a half or three and a half years off is it's a, kind of a tiny difference, I would say. I mean, it's pretty good. So also there are, um, more sophisticated methods out there by now. So this was from last year. So if you use an ensemble network, I think people have shown that you can bring down the error below two. So in that way, um, it's also pretty easy to nowadays extract age information. So, okay, so I talked a little bit about face recognition, then extracting the soft biometric attributes, how easy it is. And now I'm getting to the more, I would say, important or interesting part, hiding the soft biometric attributes so that someone cannot just train these systems that I just showed you to extract um, information about people that uh, where, for example, people didn't give consent to this extraction of information. So again, um, while we are doing that, of course, you can, oh, I, okay. While we are doing that, um, we have to keep in mind, of course, we um, don't just, to want, just want to hide this information because if we have a deep learning system and we give the objective, okay, remove um, all soft biometric information, what will likely happen is that the deep neural network will produce some images that don't represent a face image anymore. Because I mean, the perfect way of hiding this information would be just making the image blank or adding so much noise that you can't even recognize what it's in the image I mean, anymore. So what we want to do is we want to design a system that still maintains the utility of the face images. For instance, here, uh, face recognition, because face recognition has many important um, applications. And we want to maintain these um, utilities of these uh, methods that use face recognition while avoiding that someone can extract information about or more information than is needed, essentially. So in other words, um, if you don't explicitly give consent to this extraction of information, we think we shouldn't be able to access this type of information here, the soft biometric information, because yeah, if there's no consent, I think it's um, unethical to, to access this. So different um, problems that can arise with mining this soft biometric um, information is, for example, also identity theft, where someone can combine this soft biometric attribute attributes with um, publicly available data about a person. I mean, even for us, let's say as faculty, there are uh, university websites where our pictures are everywhere. And someone could, for instance, just get access to these pictures, run some algorithms on a large scale, and then get all kinds of information about people. And uh, yeah, okay, luckily, maybe our faculty pictures are never up to date. So I'm not sure how useful that would be. But in general, identity theft would be a problem or also um, 
profiling of um, people, like something that people didn't agree to, like uh, mining gender or race information of people in different locations. But then yeah, also the broader aspect of the ethics of extracting data without user's consent. And then, I mean, this could be intentional. Someone could be a malicious person extracting this data, but then also in good applications of people, of people who have a good intention, they have maybe uh, databases of these face images for let's say security purposes, but always um, there are risks with that like database breaches. So also to protect um, databases in case of a database breach, I think it might be desirable to inform uh, remove information about people that could be in the future, let's say sensitive information. Okay, so yeah, one, uh, before I show you some methods for the face images, I mean, one motivation or example where we are already doing something like that, like hiding information while maintaining the utility would be uh, for email addresses. So there's this common problem of uh, email address harvesting. I'm pretty sure most of you have encountered this where you get like spam email. And usually that happens when people have their uh, email address somewhere on their personal website because there are people using these um, automated systems or bots to crawl websites and look for certain, yeah, certain information that indicates that this is an email address. For instance, if you would put your um, email address just as it is on a website with this ad symbol, it would be pretty easy to write a program that crawls these websites and get these um, email addresses. So personally, I'm not sure how much that helps, but what I like to do is, for example, to just embed my uh, email address as an image. Um, so a person could still read this image and type this uh, email address into an email program, but these um, programs that look for these ad symbols, they would not work anymore if they are based on text. Of course, um, it's not perfect. It's not super foolproof because someone could technically write a computer vision system and apply this to this website and apply computer vision and convert this into um, yeah, letters. But I think, I mean, only a few people might do that. And I think this is still safer than just putting your um, email address and like characters in there. So it's, it's of course, um, I mean, there's always like a trade off. We still want to have the utility. I mean, I can totally hide my email address information by just blanking it out, but then also a human won't be able to use that anymore. So I kind of use that utility. And so, Analogously, the same we want to apply the same thing to the um, face images that we want to hide certain type of information but maintain the utility. So the question is basically, can we um, take similar measures to prevent soft biometric um, attribute harvesting? So there are uh, different methods that have been developed for that, where um, sensitive information can be removed. So one really good uh, approach for that would be to create your own representation of a face image. So to develop a system, let's say, prevent or produce an embedding of the face image, and then have classifiers um, checking whether the information is still there, and then develop methods to remove sensitive information. So you end up essentially with a representation of the face image that is, let's say, uh, an embedding vector or something like that, which could be super useful. The only downside of that is um, that it's not interpretable by humans anymore. So if you have a, a vector of numbers representing your face image, you can maybe train a face classifier to uh, maintain the face matching. But if you as a human want to look at it in certain applications, let's say for double checking, then you as a human lose the interpretability of the face image. And at the same point, um, at the same time, you would not be able to use that with arbitrary face matching software. So the moment you develop a system that is specialized in a certain vector representation, you would have to force everyone out there using face recognition to basically buy your software or use your software to do the face matching. So again, for certain applications, I think this is a fine approach, but it's, um, I would say for other applications, not ideal. So what we try to do is we try to develop a system that perturbs this soft biometric um, information, but still ensures that we have realistic looking face images and that it also still works with um, face matching algorithms. So I'm just briefly outlining a method we, um, developed previously before I get to the GAN part. Um, so just because this um, yeah, highlights the overall um, approach. So what we try to do here is to have a system that takes in a face image and a reference image of the face. And then it, the face matcher should still be able to verify that this is the same person. 
but a gender classifier, an arbitrary gender classifier, should not be able to tell the gender of that person. So how we did that is we uh, used an autoencoder, essentially, that uh, receives this input image and then does some modification here and then outputs a modified image, let's call it X prime. And this uh, modified image has the gender information removed while the face matcher still works. And um, the architecture, just briefly that we came up with, um, looked like that. We called it a semi-adversarial network where we have um, three sub-networks. Sub network one would be the autoencoder that modifies the face image. Sub-network two would be uh, auxiliary face matcher. We call that auxiliary because we only use that during training. And then for testing, we replace that with other face matchers to check that it generally works with any type of face matcher. And subnetwork uh, sub three would be an auxiliary gender predictor, which we use during training. And then we replace that during testing with a um, different type of gender uh, classifier. So why is this called um, yeah, semi-adversarial or what are the different objectives? So the autoencoder has the objective to modify an uh, image, but still retain the, the look of the image that it still looks realistic. For example, we can achieve that by a pixel wise um, loss here, like a pixel wise, like a, a two distance um, distance loss. And then um, for retaining the matching utility, we have also, we could have um, a score, basically how good the accuracy is before and after. And uh, for, the third objective is we want to confound the gender um, classification. So here we want to maximize the error rather than the accuracy. Yeah, and we call that um, adversarial because these two goals, um, maintaining realistic images and confounding the gender are adversarial to each other because um, they are kind of opposite goal. We want to have still realistic images, but on the other hand, we don't want um, the gender information there. However, on the other side, um, face matching and realistic images that kind of go in hand in hand. So still here, we, we want to maintain something so that's not adversarial. And since we have a not adversarial and an adversarial component, we just came up with the name semi-adversarial. Um, yeah, and all of them are convolutional networks, all these three sub-networks. Here are some results. Um, this is, uh, I mean, from 2018, so the results don't look so great. I mean, this was early, early work. Um, but yeah, just a few examples of the original inputs and the outputs. So you can see at the bottom, the face images still look like realistic face images, while there are some perturbations that um, fool the gender classifier. Um, yeah, and then, then for evaluation, we um, removed our own convolutional networks here for the face matcher and the gender classifier by um, commercial gender classifiers and uh, face matchers to evaluate the performance. and just briefly before I go to the um, generative adversary network, here are my um, results for this method where we tested this on different data sets. So this is the CELEB A data set. Then there's a MUCT data set, LFW and AR phase, just testing it on different data sets. And um, let's maybe focus on one of the data sets. So, I mean, the results are very similar on all the data sets, so we don't have to discuss all of them. So let's maybe focus on the one in the left-hand corner. And there are many uh, different plots here. So what are these plots? So uh, maybe I should start with the blue one, this uh, blue graph. So overall, this is a receiver operating characteristic curve where we essentially measure the performance of the systems. So um, male classified as male and female classified as male. And um, the random performance would be the diagonal, like in a normal receiver operating characteristic curve. So if a predictor is totally random, it would be like this um, diagonal here. And the ideal case would be, the perfect performance would be something like this, where the area under the curve would be one. And in blue, we see the gender performance before making any modification as a reference. And then at the bottom here, this, um, in brown. This is a reference method um, from another paper where um, the researchers developed a uh, yeah, gender uh, flipping method. And you can see for this gender flipping method, it's very close to random. It's almost perfect in confounding the gender classifier. Um, our method is somewhere in between. Our method is somewhere in between the non-perturbation and this um, gender flipping method. And we have, in fact, um, three different plots here or graphs. We have the orange one, the green one and the red one. 
And I kind of glanced over this because I didn't want to get, go into too much detail about this method, but we had a method for controlling how much we want to perturb the images. So let's maybe um, take the green one. So the green one is somewhere in the middle, but still it has a relatively strong perturbation, I would say. I mean, it's definitely stronger than for the blue line and it's not quite as strong as the other reference for the gender flipping, but we get kind of a good um, performance in terms of fooling the gender classifier. So now here we are evaluating now the face matching performance because like I mentioned before, we don't just want to flip the gender, we still want to maintain the utility of the face images, so the face matching. So when we look again at the reference method, which is really good at fooling the gender classifier, this method was not developed for face matching. So of course we can't um, expect it to be um, good at that, but yeah, also just for reference, this is shown here. So it has now not a very great um, face matching performance, whereas um, the original one in blue here um, is it's much better for like face matching. And our method would be somewhere in between. In fact, it's for some reason even better in, in this range. But yeah, it's maybe I should have not drawn over it, but you can see it's very close here to the blue line. So the face matching um, recognition is almost not impacted at all. So the face matching performance is just as good as before, while at the same time here, um, like I showed you before, we are able to fool this gender classifier. Um, yeah, and then we also, based on this method, developed uh, add-on methods or modifications that are generalizing to um, more diverse data sets and also to control this uh, modification gradually, like um, controlling the amount, how, how much information about the gender we remove. But of course, this comes at the trade-off of face matching um, performance. So the more gender information you remove, the stronger your modification of the image is, and then you can see also the face matching performance declines. Okay, so this was just a whirlwind tour, a very quick tour of some methods for hiding soft biometric attributes in face images. And um, now I want to go to the GAN part, which is a newer method for um, doing this sort of thing, but in a more general way. So in this um, project, we worked on um, selective and collective perturbations, um, imparting those um, multi-attribute privacy to face images. Where with um, selective, I mean that we now can choose which attributes to conceal. Before we only focused on gender. Now in this project, we um, include um, gender, age, and race as different attributes to conceal. And um, also what's new is we have this um, collective property that we can also choose how many attributes to conceal. So it doesn't have to be one attribute or all attributes. We can really as a person uh, depending on the application, choose what attribute, attribute to conceal. Um, how does that work? I mean, overall, it's uh, very similar to the approach before, but now we replace the convolutional autoencoder here with a generator. And we also use a cycle consistency loss inspired by um, cycle GAN. So just to briefly go over uh, what a cycle GAN is. So a cycle GAN is a cycle consistent uh, generative adversarial network for um, yeah, style transfer or image to image translation. So people develop this uh, network to change the style of an image. For instance, here changing a zebra into a horse and uh, changing a horse into a zebra. And what was very impressive about this um, neural network architecture is that it does not require paired images. So there were uh, methods before like the pix to pix um, architecture, which required to have um, to a pair of images, for instance, um, the horse and the zebra in the same pose. And this one uh, works just with images from domain A and domain B, uh, B but they don't have to be paired. And um, how does that work? So here's the general setup of this cycle again. So we have images of, let's say zebras, images from domain A, and we have images of horses, so images from domain B. And um, like before, we have a discriminator like in a regular GAN and um, this discriminator essentially says whether or distinguishes between real and generated images. So this is essentially like a normal GAN but then we also have um, the same thing for domain B. So we have a second uh, discriminator here on the right hand side and now this discriminator has a job uh, to distinguish between real and generated images from domain B. 
So we have two discriminators. And similarly, we also have two generators. So we have one generator that takes um, images from domain A and converts them to images from domain B. And vice versa, we have a second generator here that goes backwards. So this one takes in um, images from domain B and converts them to domain A. So you can basically go back and forth. And this, um, there's a loss component that also checks um, that those, uh, so that the, the aspect that you go back and forth is this um, cycle, and this is then this um, cycle consistency loss that you can use. Um, another idea, before I show you our architecture that we borrowed is um, this conditional nature from the conditional GAN. So in the conditional GAN, you can attach label information together with um, the input or the random noise vector to generate um, images of a certain type or a certain class. So this is shown here in this figure I took from the conditional generative adversarial network paper. And what they have here is as X, let's say the image. So this is now a vector because it's more a general representation. And they concatenate it with a label vector Y. And then they put, uh, feed this to the discriminator, which is then conditioned on this label. And similarly for the generator, they have the uh, noise vector Z and then concatenate it with a label to generate um, images from a certain or corresponding to a certain label. And this setup, um, with this setup, you can essentially train GANs that generate images for, from a certain yeah, class or corresponding to a certain label. So this is here shown for vectors, but of course, if we work with images, we have to think about how we concatenate the image information and the label information. And um, what we found work well and what other people also use is um, concatenating the label information as a channel to the image. So if you have a grayscale image, you only have one channel, but if you have, let's say, a color image, you have three channels. And if you have then a binary label, uh, like um, yes or no or something like that, or uh, some any binary label, you can um, create a channel, like which would be a matrix, that consists of this label. So for class one, you would have um, all ones in this channel. Or if you have class zero, you would have all zeros in this channel. This is just a way of um, dealing with this label information for the concatenation. And then you concatenate those two. Um, now, um, yeah, coming back to our privacy net approach. So we used both ideas, this um, cycle consistency loss idea and this conditional GAN idea to develop a system that can yeah, um, hide um, information selectively and collectively. So here what we have, we have as input and an image. We have then our generator. We only used one generator though. And we use the same generator for going back and forth, which I will explain in a minute. And we together with that have this um, target label vector, which we convert into channels to attach it to the input image. So here what's new is we provide both the input image and the target labels. And the target labels is what we want to um, convert the image to. So for instance, if the image has originally the uh, attribute female, we want to change it to male, for example, to fool the um, face matcher. Oh, sorry, the um, gender classifier. And we get then as output the modified image X prime. And in the training we use a discriminator to distinguish whether this is a real or synthesized image, similar to the conditional GAN. In addition, we use an attribute classifier that um, classifies whether this uh, modified image has indeed the attribute that we wanted it to have via specifying via the target label. And then we have this auxiliary face matcher to ensure that the face matching performance is still maintained. And the cycle loss comes into play when we convert these images back. So if I go back one slide, I'm just showing you how we go from input image to the output image. And we have like these three things attached. But then we also, what we do is we replace this one by X prime and this one then by X. So we kind of go backward. So we go from, we try to reconstruct the original image with our generator. This gives us yeah, more stability. Basically it gives us better results because it's an additional um, way of making this generator work well with arbitrary um, target labels. So it can receive target labels from both um, directions. So which is then our, our um, consistency loss. So we switch essentially target labels with original labels to go back and forth. Yeah, and um, the loss functions are then com uh, 
cons uh, they consist of these different um, smaller loss functions or individual loss functions. For training the discriminator, we have a loss based on whether an image is real or synthesized. It's similar to a regular GAN. And then in addition, we have this attribute classifier loss, which is essentially a binary classifier. Or for the H, we have more classes than that. And um, this lambda term here is just a hyperparameter so that you can adjust how much you want to uh, want this part of the loss function to contribute. So um, usually, I mean, this is something you have to experiment with. And um, yeah, just like a regular hyperparameter. And then we have for the generator also multiple components. So we have first, um, we train the generator just like in a regular GAN to fool the discriminator. So here is it's um, fooling the discriminator to tell what to think that a generated image is indeed a real image. Then we have this attribute classifier loss, um, the face matcher um, score. So we want to maintain the face recognition performance. And then lastly, um, this is for the reconstruction. So we also have an additional term to um, make sure that the reconstructed image, if we go backward from the cycle consistency, is as close as possible to the original image. It's just an additional term. It's just a pixel-wise um, similarity term. So because of time reasons, I knew I was probably about to run out of time. Um, I don't have the details about um, how these loss functions are implemented here in the slides, but they are basically just like a regular classifier or regular GAN. Again, and if you're interested, um, there are more details in the paper too. So just to uh, yeah, finish the talk by showing you some examples. So here are some results where we have on the left-hand side, the privacy net approach. And on the right-hand side, in each column is the baseline GAN. So the baseline GAN here is a cycle GAN without all the components in the privacy net. It's just a regular cycle GAN. Yeah, and you can see, looking at these columns, um, the face images, they have very minimal changes, I would say. I mean, there's almost no change in these images. And um, G here would be, for example, by um, achieved by flipping the gender. Uh, H would be uh, assigning a different H. We had only three H groups to keep things simple. Um, and R is for the race. And G, A, zero would be for gender and H and so forth. So there are more below here, which didn't fit on the slide. But yeah, this is just like a visual um, example of the outputs. On the performance, um, so the performance of the face matching is also relatively well maintained. I mean, it's not perfect, of course, but it's also not bad. So here, what we did is we put, as so we have more, of course, evaluation graphs in the paper, but I didn't want to overwhelm you with all the information in such short time. So here's, I would say, the most um, yeah, interesting plot. So showing the face matching performance, and we group together all the modifications you can do for each individual image. So there are different five, 15 different uh, modifications if you consider all the combination of attributes you can modify. And in red, this is our baseline GAN, a regular cycle GAN. And you can see it's well below the original performance. So the blue dotted line here is the original performance. And our um, privacy net is somewhere in between. Of course, it's not perfect in terms of retaining the face matching accuracy, but it's um, definitely better than um, yeah, like a baseline GAN. So it's at least something that works relatively well, I would say. And of course, it's also only a proof of concept. Nowadays, um, we used to, for that a simple convolutional network. So you can also replace this with maybe state-of-the-art networks, even considering uh, visual transformers, which are a hot uh, research area right now. And Sebastian, you probably even one minute, can... one minute, Sebastian. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. So just briefly, one limitation of our approach is also that we used um, only three uh, labels for H, uh, just to keep things simple for this proof of concept. But you could, of course, also think of the order and regression network that we use to improve this method. And yeah, with that, um, now that we are yeah, capable of hiding, let's say, H information, might be interesting to think of future solutions for digital age verification um, to make age verification work again. Uh, was like it's a little joke. Um, some people may know the relation between these two objects. Uh, I was just born at the time where these were still a thing. Um, yeah, okay, so this is also yeah, the end of my talk.